Are we recording? Yeah, okay. I, I think. Yeah. <laughs>
us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day to be together and worship you, worship you in spirit and in truth. And Father, thank you for each person that's here, and we pray, Lord, that each of us will receive a blessing that we can take out with us through the week and spread your word of your love and, and grace and mercy that you give each one of us. In thy name we pray, amen. Good morning again there. Uh, welcome. Uh, if there's anyone visiting, welcome to you and all of our regulars. It's good to see you all this morning. So uh, I have a, some announcements to share. John is on his way back, by the way. He was in Texas, and he is headed home. So uh, he'll be hopefully be with us next week. And uh, so uh, we uh, are looking forward to that anyway. So be in, be in prayer for travel mercies for him on his way home. Uh, let's see. For as far as today goes, immediately following our morning worship time, uh, we'll be having a, our book club. So all the book club members stick around for that. And we'll uh, definitely uh, have a, a good discussion this week, I think, this month about, the, about our book and good food as well. Uh, at 3 o'clock today, Pastor's going to be at Timberview for the, his uh, service there. And then at 6 o'clock this evening, uh, Smokey Wilson will be here for uh, to give us a gospel concert. So, Everyone be sure to come out this evening. He's always the, gives a good, uh, a good, uh, and uh, very much so blessed performance for us. And we don't want Melrose Church of the Brothers to outpopulate us. Right. <laughs> I don't know if you <laughs> heard that <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we, it's always nice if our church has a better show than any other church does. <laughs> then we have these people in. So come on out tonight. Uh, and uh, let's see. That's I think that takes care of today. <laughs> And uh, then on the, the 21st is the Bible study of Town and Country at 9.30. And then at 5 o'clock that evening, our catechism class will continue here at the church. Uh, the 22nd at 7 is the online Bible study. The 20, uh, 26th at 7 is the Bible study of the gals. And then, uh, it's hard to believe, but September is nearly here. So that will be uh, our... Uh, uh, see, the, we'll have, September 3rd, we'll have a, a Chris CE meeting for the CE leaders. Uh, so anybody who's involved with uh, uh, youth meetings or even if it, as a Sunday school teacher, if you wish to come to the meeting to get you informed as to what's going to be happening and some of the things that uh, we'll be trying for the, the year to come, uh, Cindy will uh, have that meeting at uh, 6.30 on September 3rd. Then on the 8th, we'll have a breakfast for our grandparents. Uh, we always take care of the uh, mothers and the fathers. This year we're going to have a uh, breakfast for the grandparents. So be sure to come out at, at 9.30 uh, at, uh, on the 8th for our grandparents' breakfast. And then don't forget the, uh, the camp meeting services that are coming up in September, the uh, 9th through the 14th, 7 o'clock in the evening at the uh, Ruritan Park. So uh, come on out for them and, and uh, uh, show, uh, show your love for God learn and, and share with other members of the, uh, the community, too, for that. Uh, don't forget to always check your uh, birthdays and anniversaries that are coming up that are listed in the bulletin. Um, and if your kids are in need of some school supplies, uh, they, uh, they have some, uh, thanks to our awesome youth group who's, who uh, provided the, uh, the, the means to, uh, to get these uh, supplies. Uh, if you want, need anything, see uh, uh, Michelle Biller or Grace Conley, and uh, they'll help you pick some out for you. And uh, that'll be a big help for your, hopefully for your going back to school. Uh, the CE Youth uh, regular meetings will start again on uh, Sunday, September 1st. And uh, our CE groups meet on the first and the third Sundays of each month at, during the morning worship time. And that, that uh, last, you know, do that all through the uh, duration of the school year so uh, kids can be prepared for that. Uh, also, there's a notice about the, from the Kingsway Prison and Family Outreach, and they invite you to their uh, annual banquet on a, August the 29th at 6 p.m. at Harrisonburg First Assembly of God. The address is there before you. And uh, to, please join us as we celebrate 40 plus years of service to those uh, impacted by incarceration. Uh, it says, please be as RSPP, uh, to those numbers uh, by, uh, I don't know how quickly, but just as soon as you can, 
Uh, if you have any questions, uh, see Paula, and she'll be able to answer any questions that you might have about that. Uh, let's see. I don't, think. Uh, don't forget to, uh, to mark your calendars for October 12th for our St. Jude fundraiser, and uh, also uh, our, uh, the shoebox collection is uh, still going full steam ahead, so read the notices about that, and don't forget about the, the food pantry. Shirley says the cooler is, is fixed, working, and, and uh, they have some uh, fresh vegetables. But if you have fresh vegetables that you would like to take back for them, uh, that would be fine, too. They, they would accept to give away. So, uh, yes? They're only open on the first Monday of the month and the third Thursday uh, during the day. Okay, first Monday and third, the so evening. third Thursday in the evening. The third Thursday. Third Thursday um, in the evenings, yeah. yeah. some sweet corn in the uh, lobby. People are free to grab some on their way out. Okay. Now there's sweet corn out there in the lobby. And it looks good. So uh, be sure and help yourself to some on the way out. It was, uh, it was donated to us from the uh, produce stand that Robert uh, Knowles works at. So. Very good. All righty. Uh, we'll, let's uh, take a moment to greet one another and then uh, uh, we'll have our uh, chorus. Right.
Lord, we thank you for the opportunity of being in your house again this morning. We would ask that you would bless everyone here. Bless those that have to give. Bless those that do not. And just bless those who are missing, whatever the reasons may be, and lead them back to us. Lord, let us all be more faithful to thee and go out and tell others about thee. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Carolyn Miller was not able to be here. I'm not as pretty as she is, but I'll do my best. Um, I wrote this song, uh, I think I was still in Wisconsin at the time, so this is a little while back. But the song has, uh, has expressed my own walk with God, I don't know how many times. Um, sometimes I think that God conflicts a pastor so the pastor can learn something and then turn around and share with his congregation. And um, I, I was having a conversation with my journal the other night. And one of the things I was thinking about was my own human problems that I have, my, my sinful uh, behaviors that occasionally manifest. And I, I wrote in my journal that I think that if God can't shake my faith, or if Satan can't shake my faith in God, then he'll try and shake my faith in myself. I don't have a trouble whatsoever believing in God. But I know myself. And I know that unless I'm obeying God, I know that I'll behave corruptly. Sometimes mildly, but corrupt nevertheless. You know that? And so sometimes, and you're going to hear it in this song, but there's just times where I feel, personally, I feel like I really need to get my head screwed back on straight. And so I'm hoping that, that uh, maybe there might be somebody here that could use the testimony I gave, but also use the song. Sometimes my heart gets heavy when I think of who I am. When I see my imperfections when I fall short of his plan, then I think that I should run away. He'd be better without me. Then his spirit comes to talk to my heart, and through his word he promises me that when he is done with me, I will be like him when he is done with me I know I will be free for his blood is made I'm sorry blood come on now figure it out blood has made me holy in my Father's loving eyes, so I will press on and take a hold. I will stand firm and I will be bold. When my faith is sight, I know I will be like Him. It's not an easy from who I am to who I'll be, letting go of all my hurt and pain means letting go of me. I trusted God with my salvation, now I need to trust Him with my life. The life I live, I'll live by faith. It's by His Spirit, not by might. But when He is done with me, I will be like 
We thank you, Lord, that you are a much stronger God than that and not nearly as, as emotional and not nearly as volatile as we are, but rather instead you're a God that makes all of his decisions with full knowledge and understanding of what you're doing. We thank you, God, for saving us. There's not a one of us here that has been converted by you that believes himself worthy of what you have done. Not a one of us. For we all know, Lord, how weak we are. We know the corruption of the flesh that Adam gave us. And yet, Lord, you've caused your Holy Spirit to dwell within us so that the contrast between following the Spirit and following the flesh is immense. Help us to be a people that walk by the Spirit. Help us, Lord, to do that. Help us to remember, Lord, that sanctification is a process and that one day you will be done with that process and we will be glorified and we will be, as the scripture says, like you are. And the scripture says, Lord, that we will know fully even as we are fully known now. And until that day, Lord, when we are raised incorruptible and raised immortal, until that day, sustain us in the power of your right arm. I thank you, God, for how you have worked in Kathy's life and the disappointing news today, Father. I pray, God, that you would overcome that news and that you would give her a new sense of her own health, that uh, she would not only be strong as she is, Lord, but that you would bring healing into her life. Some healing full healing, whatever you choose. But God, knowing that there's nothing that those you've given to us as mercy, the doctors, can do, we know, Lord, that the one who gave us the doctors and made the medicine and made the intelligence to achieve these things, the God that created all the heavens and the earth, that, Lord, you can do this. And so, God, we commit her into your hands for you to do your will in her life, whatever it may be. We thank you, God, for uh, anniversaries, and we thank you, God, for uh, health that you have given and kindnesses, mercies, Lord, that you have extended to us. So many that are here today, Lord, could count their blessings and count the mercies of God, and they would be forever in a day writing them down if they should write them or pondering them should they ponder them. God, you've been so kind to your church. You give us food. You give us water. You give us all, Lord, that we need. We didn't ask to be created. Not a one of us asked to be created. But, oh, Lord, that you created us and then that you loved us. That means so much. So as your created beings, Lord, we come before you to thank you and to praise you for the holy work that you have done among us and are doing among us. We thank you, Lord, for the teachers and the medicine and the doctors and all of these things, missionaries and military and all that you've given to us, Lord. Some are missionaries locally, some are missionaries abroad, but God help us to be ready to give an account of what we believe in season and out of season. Help us to walk faithfully before you in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Today's probably one of the more traveled Bible stories, but um, I want us to uh, turn to Genesis chapter 22. And um, we're going to start up at verse 1. We're going to read down through verse 19 to get the entirety of this particular story. Some time later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah 
sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain that I will show you. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. And when he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out to the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. And he said to his servants, Stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship, and then we will come back to you. <coughs> Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac and carried uh, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. And as the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and wood are here, Isaac said. But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. And when they had reached the place that God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham! Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God, because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up, and there in the thicket was a ram caught by the horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And on this day, it is said, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. Now the, the term the Lord will provide, Jehovah Jireh, in case you're not familiar. Uh, the angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time. And he said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies, and through your offspring all nations will be blessed because you have obeyed me. Then Abraham returned to his servants, and they set off together for Beersheba, and Abraham stayed in Beersheba. Okay. Wow. Right? What a story. There's a few things here that I want us to take a look at as we look at the story and evaluate. This is a foretaste of what is going to happen on Galgotha. Now, Galgotha is built on part of Mount Moriah. It's the highest part of Mount Moriah. Considering that the mentality of the day was that the higher you got, the closer you would get to God, the more likely he would be to hear you. It's possible that although that kind of paganism may not have been present in Abraham at this time, that the pattern of that may still have held true. And it's very possible uh, that on Galgotha, uh, not only was Isaac initially offered, but Jesus later on. Now, some, some put the altar of Abraham off to the side from Galgotha. It's still on Mount Moriah. And uh, this is where the Temple Mount is today, still on Mount Moriah. So let's take a look at verses 1 to 3. In verses 1 to 3, we see a few things here, that God is testing Abraham. Now, the King James Version uses the word tempt. Uh, so that you don't get confused if you use King James, so you don't get confused, please understand that even Old English has different connotations. 
The Bible says that God is not tempted, nor does he tempt with evil. So the word tempt there is accurately connotated test. So this is a test that God is giving to Abraham, regardless of the word tempt in the King James. God's testing or trying of your faith is a revelation for our sakes. The revelation of the testing of your faith, trying of your faith, is not because God doesn't know. It's because he wants to show you what he has built into you, sometimes without you even knowing it. And so he puts it to the test so that you can see how far he has brought you. Now looking at a couple of passages here, James 1, uh, 3 for instance. And here the elder James, he says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance or patience as the King James puts it. Okay, here James, Jesus' brother, he is saying to his readers that when God tests your faith, he puts you through trials of many kinds. When he is testing your faith, he puts you through trials of many kinds. Why does he do that? Because he wants you to see your faith at work. Because your faith, you're going to find out in the midst of these trials, that your faith is not something that you did. And you're going to be amazed at how you are able to weather the storm that God sends into your life and come out the other side with your faith intact rather than destroyed. Now in my life, and I've mentioned that earlier, but in my life, I've been through many trials. Stuff that I've not talked to you about, stuff that's rather personal, stuff that just like you, if it's rather personal, unless you felt like you needed to talk to me as your pastor, otherwise you probably keep to yourself. But I've been through a lot of these things, and what I have noticed is that every time God puts me through something, it's because he is building into me even more faith than I had before. He's not doing it to tear me down. He's not doing it to harm me. But rather instead, he's doing it to expose something about me. 1 Corinthians 3 would be the next passage for us to look at. 1 Corinthians in chapter 3. Looking at uh, verses 11 to 15. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds up this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, their work will be shown for what it is because the day will bring it to light and it will be revealed with fire. And the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. If it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved, even though as one escaping through the flames. Now here, Paul is telling us about the trying of the, the life that we're building. If we're building with just wood, hay, and stubble, the whole thing is going to be burned up. But if we're building with gold, silver, or costly stones, the fire won't harm it. 
So when the fire of testing comes into your life, as it's coming into Abraham's in our text, it's not, for, it's not because God doesn't know. It's because Abraham doesn't know. It's not because God doesn't know. It's because you don't know what's happening. And if you've been building your life with your own inventions, with your own ideas, with your own approach, with your own twist on things, if you're building your life that way, then that's wood, hay, and stubble. But if you're building your life on obedience, then God gives you gold with which to build your life. God gives you silver with which to build your life. God gives you precious stones with which to build your life. And through obedience, you are building a precious life with gold and silver and precious stones. And it's obedience that is the key here. It's not cleverness. And so the day of testing will come to all of us when we will find out, have we been building through obedience or have we been building through invention? The Bible says this in Psalm 99 and verse 8. You took vengeance on their inventions. The first part of that, you forgave them of their sins, but took vengeance on their inventions. God takes vengeance on your inventions. He brings it out into the light. He tests your work with fire. And if it was just you, and if it was all you, it's all going to be burned. Now, what does the Bible say, though, in, in some kind of a, a of almost a dystopian hope, if it were, that, that even if God has converted your soul and even if you've built on invention and not much at all was through obedience, you'll still be saved, but you'll be saved like somebody escaping from a fire. You'll get away with your life, but you won't have anything to show for. But that's God's promise to you. Now you say, well, that's okay with me. I'd like to be like one escaping through fire. Shame on you for even thinking such a thought. Next. All tests boil down to a response in obedience. If you have faith in God, as a result of that, you will obey. If you have no faith in God, as a result of that, you will disobey. To the extent at which you have faith in God, you will obey, and to the extent at which you do not have faith in God, you will disobey. Disobedience follows unbelief. Hebrews chapter 3, Hebrews chapter 4. But obedience follows faith. Romans 14, 23. Hebrews 3 and 4. And so we see in the passages of Scripture that all of this is boiling down to obedience. So, if we take a look in the text again, we see here that Abraham obeyed. We don't even see evidence of a debate. The next morning, Abraham got up. Do you realize this is the second time that God has said to Abraham, follow me to a place I will show you? It's the second time. Abraham left everything that he knew and wound up in Canaan, the place that God would show him. Now he's saying, I'm going to take you to a mountain that I will show you in the region of Moriah. Now this is, mountain, of course, has become known as Mount Moriah. And so this is the second time, and the first time that God said, leave everything you know and everybody you love and your family and all that and follow me to a place I'll show you. That first time, what did Abraham do? Did he debate with God? Did he talk with God? No, we have no evidence of that. 
what we see is that Abraham just simply got up and went. He obeyed God and it was credited to him as righteousness because he believed. And so here we see that Abraham continues in that pattern. For all of the, uh, of the humanism that gets thrown into this story all of the time, of Abraham having a debate with God or Isaac and, and Abraham having a discussion, this is what we know. Isaac at this particular time, Jewish history has him at about 25. That's what Josephus says. He was about 25, Jewish history says. Now, he's 37 at, in chapter uh, 23 when his mother dies. He's 37 there. Um, so time perhaps has passed between the end of 22 and the, end of, and the beginning of 23. But Abraham is over 100 at this point. He's at least 125 if, if Isaac is 25. So if Isaac's a 25-year-old kid, that's older than Lincoln. If Isaac's a 25-year-old lad, why then imagine that you, you remember Ishmael, right? When he was running away, the Bible referred to him as a lad. And he was also in his 20s. So imagine that people are living to be, you know, 130, 140 years old. I suppose that a 25-year-old would seem to be a lad. Uh, to us, living to be, you know, 80 maybe if we're lucky. Uh, sometimes we live past that. To us, a 25-year-old is a young man, not a lad. But that's what it, the Bible refers to them as. So here this lad, 25 years old, is carrying uh, his share and up the hill. And they're going, and where's the lamb? And his old 125-year-old daddy says, says uh, God will provide the lamb as they walk up carefully up this hill. Now, we don't see any record here of Abraham building the altar and Isaac helping him and 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 then we and then the wood is there and then Abraham lifts up Isaac and puts him helplessly on the on the bier. We don't see that. <laughs> what we see, what we see is a 25-year-old fellow, in a sense, climbing up on it. Isaac is being humble here. Isaac is, is part of the process. Isaac is, is copying the obedience of his father and is climbing up onto this <coughs> altar on top of the wood, waiting for his dad to slit his throat like they did with the lambs and the other sacrifices. There's no argument from Abraham or from Isaac. There is no debate and there is no, oh my goodness, how would this make you feel? That's not what the scripture is calling us to. The scripture is calling us to observe that in spite of the trial and the storm that God is inflicting on Abraham and Isaac, that Abraham and Isaac are believing God and trusting in in some sense, Isaac is trusting his father's faith in God. In some sense. Um, oh, I had, had a passage I wanted to read here. Um, Isaiah 51, if you would. And um, we're looking at uh, verses 12 and 13. I, even I, am he who comforts you. Who are you that you tear, or that you fear mere mortals, human beings who are but grass, that you forget the Lord your maker who stretches out the heavens and who lays the foundations of the earth, that you live in constant terror every day, 
because of the wrath of the oppressor who is bent on destruction. For where is the wrath of the oppressor? In the face of the Almighty God. How can you fear people? How can you fear this life in the face of the Almighty God? Next, uh, verses 4 to 8, we want to look at this uh, the subject of believing God. First of all, we see some evidence of this. Abraham says to his servants, we will come back. He doesn't say, I will come back. He says, we will come back. So as far as Abraham is concerned, there is hope that Isaac is going to return with him. He's not being a liar. He's not making up a story. He has faith that Isaac will come back with him. Now in Hebrews chapter 11, verses 17 to 19, We read this, by faith Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promise was about to sacrifice his one and only son. Now in the King James there it says his only begotten son. That's going to be important, okay? So keep that in mind. Even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. And so in a manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. So when, when uh, Abraham is putting Isaac on the altar, what he is doing according to the scripture is obeying God knowing that God had promised that through Isaac his offspring would be reckoned and thereby believed and trusted that God would give him Isaac back even from the dead if necessary to fulfill his promises. Now that, friends, is faith. That God keeps his promises even when the circumstances are saying otherwise. Then we also have this evidence. God will provide the lamb. Abraham trusted God's character. So, and we will be back shows that Abraham trusted God's promise, but here it shows that Abraham trusted God's character. Now, why do I say that? Because God never said he would provide a lamb. We don't see a promise in this text that God would provide a lamb. But Abraham trusted now the character of God, reasoning that God would provide a substitute. Now, perhaps he was referring metaphorically to Isaac as the lamb, but I don't believe he is. I think he believes that God is a God that is a God of character, predictable character. Leviticus 18, 21. Now this is something that we're privy to after the story, after this text. However, that does not mean that it's not part of God's character just because it was revealed in later text. But Leviticus 18, and then verse 21. It says this, Do not give any of your children to be sacrificed to Moloch, for you must not profane the name of the Lord your God. I am the Lord. And then also, uh, looking at Luke 18, 16. Luke 18, 16. And here we see, but Jesus called the children to him and said, let the little children come unto me and do not hinder them for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. 
So in this, these passages, we see, first of all, that God will not have children sacrificed to him. And then second of all, we see that Jesus counts children precious. So the character of God dictates clearly that the sacrifice that is being asked of Abraham is out of character. And so Abraham expects God to act in, in a, a concert with his own character. And so Abraham says with confidence to Isaac, God will provide the lamb. Now, in, again, he is not, I don't believe here, being euphemistic. I believe that the scripture is telling us that Abraham fully expected for God to provide another way. But Abraham continued to obey God clear up to the point at which he had his knife out and was ready to cut the, the young man's throat. And God stopped him. The whole time, I, I, you know, you, you have one of two possibilities that are going on in Abraham's head. Either God's going to provide a lamb, which he didn't promise, but would be in, in, in concert with his character, or God is going to give me Isaac back from the dead after I have uh, slit his throat and bled him and burned him. Uh, I was ungrateful in reading the text that it was the first, not the second. Um, I wouldn't want to read of such a thing. So then, redemptive justice. The sacrifice of an only begotten son is repeated in John 3.16. And, uh, John, and Hebrews 11, 17 in the King James uses that phrase. In both cases, these were not their only sons. In Isaac's case, he had an older brother, Ishmael. In Adam's, or Jesus' case, he had an older brother, Adam. The older brother, Adam, of course, being the first man created. Luke chapter 3 calls him the son of God. He had no other father. So Jesus then is the second Adam, as it were. The first Adam, through his disobedience, condemned everybody of his seed to death. The second Adam, through his obedience, has brought life to everybody that are begotten through him. This is also a substitutionary sacrifice. John 10, verses 14 through 18. I invite you to turn with me. John 10, verses 14 through 18. Jesus speaking, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my Father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my Father. So Jesus is talking about his death. That as the good shepherd, he's going to lay down his life for his sheep. He's going to save his sheep. Now we've talked in the past about, about how that, that sacrifice, how that substitutionary atonement takes place and how we receive it. We receive it through marriage. 
We receive it through the covenant of marriage. That is, God chooses us to be a part of his bride or elects us. Okay, And so, in electing us to be a part of his bride, he brings us into a relationship with him. The two become one flesh, and we receive that which does not belong to us. And it becomes ours to use and ours as a benefit, but not ours to take and leave the relationship and still have it. The relationship is the saving situation. That's where we're saved. We're betrothed to Christ, and now we are married to Christ in the sense of a betrothal, but one day we will be married to him in the sense of the event. And after that, we are forever glorified. Forever. There's no, no going back to being sinful or corrupt ever again. Yeah, amen, absolutely. Absolutely. I saw one of us go amen and look up to heaven. And I said absolutely amen. Okay, so what do we have here in this substitutionary sacrifice? We have Jesus betrothing himself to us in John chapter 14. And so the betrothal is as good as a marriage, and so imputation takes place. His righteousness and holiness are imputed to you. You don't deserve them. You don't own them. It's not yours. But in the same sense, your sins are are imputed to Christ. They're not his. He doesn't own them. Yet, because of imputation, when he goes to the cross and he dies, he dies with all of your sin upon him. That is, if you're converted, part of the church. He dies with your sins on him. All of your sins. You weren't even born yet, so all of your sins, if you can understand that. If he died for you before you were born, then he died for you for all of your sin. Not just up to a point. He died for all of it. All of it. You're completely and utterly saved if God has converted you. Last of all, this is one head redeemed by the greater head. You notice that I, in this I've used a capital to denote the head meaning Christ. And the head meaning Isaac is the small h. Isaac redeemed by Christ. One head redeemed by another head. As it was necessary for Christ to die for his church, it was necessary for Isaac to die for his nation. Do you understand this? If he is to be the head of the nation God is creating, at this point in the text, Israel doesn't exist. If Isaac is to be the head of the nation God is creating, then he, being the head, must die for their sins. However, God provides a lamb that is a ram caught by its horns in the thicket. He provides that lamb to substitutionarily take away the sin of Isaac so that Isaac might live, but the ram might die. So in the same sense here, God is purifying his nation through Christ. Now let's take a look at Galatians 3.16 to uh, start to get an idea of this. And I realize that I need to push a little here, but we really need to get this information. 3.16. It says, The promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed, Scripture does not say, and to seeds, meaning many people, but and to your seed, meaning one person who is Christ. So when the scripture says 
that the promises are for Abraham and his seed, it doesn't mean the whole multitude of people, but it means the one person who would come from Abraham who would redeem the nation of Israel and by doing so also redeem the church. Look at uh, Hebrews 7, 9 through 10. Hebrews 7, verses 9 through 10. One might even say that Levi, who collects the tenth, paid the tenth through Abraham, because when Melchizedek met Abraham, Levi was still in the body of his ancestor. Now in this portion of Scripture from Hebrews, what uh, Christ is saying is he's saying that when Abraham paid a tithe to Melchizedek, that Levi, being in his loins still, as it were, was present also paying the tithe with his ancestor. And therefore, Levi, in some sense, was actually submitting to Melchizedek as the greater high priest. Now, this is in the midst of an argument that Jesus is a part of the high priesthood of Melchizedek, rather than that of Levi. Levi being the lesser, Melchizedek being the greater. And he demonstrates that with this argument. So now if we take this argument and we apply it to today's text, we understand that all of the people not yet born that would be Israel are in a sense in the loins of Isaac. And so if we apply that argument to this text, then we understand that when that ram was caught in the thicket and was burned to save Isaac, it was also save, it was also burned to save his seeds, those who would descend from Isaac as well. Now to clarify a point, which I think needs to be clarified before we're done, Jesus said in John chapter 8 that God is able to raise up from these stones children for Abraham. And so the claim that they were making that they were Abraham's children by nature was not sufficient. But that they would be children of Abraham if they did what Abraham did, which was honor God. And so Abraham honored God, Isaac honored God, and all of those who are the seed of Isaac, that is the descendants of Isaac, are descendants because they honor God. And those who come from Isaac and reject God and rebel against God, they're lost. They're not saved, even though the ram was given for Isaac. So this saves the nation, that is the remnant of Israel, and this saves the church, that is the remnant of Israel plus the remnant of the Gentiles. And what we see here is so thoroughly thought out by God, you cannot possibly say that your salvation is a mere incident or accident. Let's say the Romans doxology together. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, or who hath been his counselor, or who has first given to him, and it shall be recompensed unto him again. For of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be the glory forever. Amen. Please stand with me and turn to hymn number 129. 
Shall we pray together? Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that you allow us through our obedience to, to live a, a faithful life in you. And Father, we thank you that your mercy and grace allow us to follow your guidance and helps us to understand your plan. Lord, watch over us all as we go out this week and, and bring us back safely together next week. In thy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm.